Uh, my sense is that a lot of people say diversity matters, um, but deep down they think that it doesn't matter that much or can actually be antithetical to the performance of an organisation. Can you hear me, Matthew? I can, I can. How are you? I'm very good. How are you? Nice to meet it, you. Likewise. Uh, how are things? Uh, pretty good. Pretty good. I've got my well-thumbed copy of your book. Lots of... Thrilled to see that. Yeah, lots of uh, post-it notes. And actually, it's the second time I've read it because um, I read it pre-lockdown. And then, of course, my copy's back in the office. So um, I had to get another copy. But... Oh, well, I, I, that's... Uh... Above and beyond. But like, like, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Look, but you're doing. You, are you well? Yeah. Um, all good. Fascinating period and, and and a challenging one in lots of different ways. What about you? Have you? Have you yeah. Done, yeah. What? I'm working hard at home and um, three kids here, doing their best to you know keep going and uh, keep themselves occupied. And no, they've done great actually. I'm here with Matthew Said, who's a journalist, broadcaster, champion table tennis player, and I'm delighted to say, winner of the 2020 CMI Management Book of the Year Award for his new book, Rebel Ideas, The Power of Diverse Thinking. So it's great to see you, Matthew. Thank you for your time today. Many congratulations. That's extremely kind. I'm very gratified to win this award, uh, Matthew. It's, 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 it's a wonderful thing. I I wrote the book feeling that diversity is an issue of huge significance. Um, obviously, it has a, has a significance in terms of morality and social justice, but I also think it's probably the key factor that drives high performance in, in business and in management, particularly in the field of innovation, but beyond. So I'm, I'm thrilled to uh, engage with you today, and thanks for inviting me. No, well, it's lovely to have you. And I always feel this is the most unfair and uh, poor question to put to an author of a book who spent sweated hours over, you know, several hundred pages. But can you give us a quick summary of what Rebel Ideas is all about? Bearing in mind our community of managers and leaders across all sorts of organisations. Well, I, my sense is that a lot of people say diversity matters, um, but deep down they think that it doesn't matter that much or can actually be antithetical to the performance of an organisation. Because if you're hiring diverse people rather than the best people, it almost sounds like it is opposed to meritocracy, which is an extremely important uh, attribute of organisations. In the book, I argue that when it comes to complex decisions – strategic decisions, coming up with new ideas, making forecasts and predictions, it is crucial, first of all, to have a team, because no one perspective is enough, no one brain is enough, but that when you can optimise the cognitive diversity, that's to say the different insights, perspectives and information, then you get a much stronger result. And the, uh, the evidence on this is overwhelming. But the real point of the book is that this evidence is very deeply misunderstood. Okay, in what way? Well, I think that the major problem is we tend to think about diversity almost exclusively in demographic terms, differences in gender, race, social class. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the key concept is cognitive diversity, different thoughts and perspectives and insights. Mm -hmm. These two things are often quite related because our identities inform our experiences and the way we make sense of the world. But there are many contexts where you can have people who look diverse, but yeah. who think in exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. They've been in an organisation for so long, they reach for the same metaphors and historical precedents to reason through problems. They are not going to find that they are ahead of the curve. They're going to be disrupted and they're going to miss the big picture. So it's, it's that aspect that I try to really land in the book. Great, great. Thank you. And you do. I'm a big fan. I've enjoyed it very much. I think it's really interesting. You use the word rebel. Another big word in business right now is disruptors. It feels to me like all the naughty children uh, who were in the past sort of deemed as troublemakers in the classroom are now 
what we need to bring them into into the conversation and if we can bring them the troublemakers in what you're saying and others are saying is that that's where you get kind of fertility and new ideas uh, but the key you, you're right the absolute key to this is that if you reach out for diverse ideas in a highly frivolous way that's to say imagine that you are designing a hadron collider and somebody says well at the moment we have some very good engineers and theoretical physicists but what we really need right now is a lot of skateboarders it may well be that those skateboarders contribute nothing at all in fact they're likely to contribute nothing at all so what i try and do in the book is i try and show that what you need are disruptors whose ideas are different to the status quo, but nevertheless relevant, that they somehow impinge upon the problem. I think that identifying those voices is the absolute key. That you need, There needs to be some way of maximizing the breadth of an organizational uh, understanding of a problem while sustaining its depth. So I think both of us would agree that you do need depth, you need expertise, you need understanding, you need people who have some track record in a particular domain. It's when that expertise is disrupted by ideas that are nevertheless relevant, but outside the conceptual milieu, outside the silo, outside the, uh, you know, perhaps the institution as yeah. traditionally defined, that you get innovation. This is not just true of business by the way, it's true of science as well. Yes, yeah. yes. I'm wondering, I mean, you wrote the book pre-COVID crisis. Um, have, you, uh, have you written an, an additional chapter? Have you got a view on how the ideas might be updated in the light of COVID? Because they, they, they feel, interestingly, very fresh to me. Thank you. Yeah, so, so um, funnily enough, the paperback edition that you were holding up at the beginning of our conversation, then, which seems to have lots of orange post-it notes inside, which is very good to see. It certainly does. <laughs> um, I, uh, that came out just in the first week of lockdown. Um, so I will add, uh, I think, a chapter or, or, or a postscript or a prelude to the book because I think one of the errors, I've looked very closely at the UK government's response to COVID. I think one of the problems is there was insufficient diversity in the key group, which, was, which is called SAGE. This is a scientific advisory group for emergencies. Two of its representatives sit on COBRA. And of course, you remember that at the beginning, COBRA was being directed effectively by this scientific advice. But the problem with SAGE is it was very full of clinical academics, modelers and mathematicians, but not enough frontline public health experts on those on communicable diseases. Now, why is this relevant? The reason is all of the planning documents leading up to 2010, uh, but building up to 2020, were based on the idea that a dangerous epidemic would follow the contours of pandemic flu. Mm. And pandemic flu spreads through the population. It's pointless trying to contain it. So you get to her herd immunity quite quickly. Yeah. Um, now, in, uh, now, all of the documents that were published up until March 2020 were starting with lines like, we are assuming for the purposes of this paper that we are dealing with pandemic flu. Mm. But of course, we were dealing with a coronavirus. Yeah. The question is... Is the coronavirus different in some significant policy way? And the answer to that was yes, because in Korea and elsewhere in Asia, they were showing that it was containable mm. via something called test and trace. Yeah. In other words, mass testing and contact tracing. Um, we didn't model that as an option. And it was not even considered. Mm. And the reason is because we just assumed it would... This is why we didn't ramp up testing capacity in those crucial early weeks. You might remember. Yeah. We're going to let it spread in the population. We're not going to do any community testing. This was, all of these tactical decisions were based on the fundamental idea that this was going to be like pandemic flu. Now, it may well be that in the future we don't find a vaccine and it does spread through the population, but there's no doubt as of today we would have been in a better place had we had a more diverse... I mean, you, you, the book really is... Uh, kind of encouraging people to avoid groupthink, and you've just talked about that. Um, 
equally, there are times when a sense of unity and common purpose are absolutely invaluable. I think um, George Orwell, it was, who talked about the extraordinary emotional unity of the British during the Second World War. Um, I mean, we're in a we're in a time of crisis. Explore that 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 kind of problem in a way there that that how you can avoid groupthink but keep common purpose. So there are two, thank you. There are two, so I think two fundamentally different issues. One is when you're trying to come up with a strategy, say, and coming up with a strategy is quite a difficult thing to do because it has lots of different dimensions to it. If it's only one person determining the strategy it's very possible that it will be a poor strategy. This is why leaders put a team together to give them advice before coming up with a strategy. Um, this is where you need to hear what different people think so you can marshal all of that information to come up with a really wise strategy. That's where diversity is important. Mm. If you just have everyone saying not what they think, but what they think the leader wants to hear, yeah. you might as well not have the group. Now that's fine. If the leader knows everything, there's no problem. Yeah. If the leader doesn't know everything about the problem, in other words, if it's a difficult problem, that's a disaster. And we know this. I mean, it's intuitive, but it's very clear from voluminous evidence. Having made a decision, however, having decided we're going to go to A rather than B, C, D, or E, then I think you want to have unity of purpose. And if at that point people start saying, oh, no, we should have gone to B when you're already halfway to A or C or D, that can be problematic. So I draw a distinction in the book between yeah. evaluation, where you need diversity, and execution, where you need unity of purpose. Yeah. I mean, there are some broad caveats you can make to that. Even when executing, it can sometimes be worth pivoting and adapting in the light of new information. But nevertheless, I think that broad conceptual distinction is, is a valid one. And it's also worth saying that one can have diversity of thought even during the evaluation stage with unity of purpose. In other words, why are we listening to diverse voices on what we do? Because we're united in wanting to do the best thing possible. Mm -hmm. This, I think, is what characterised the war spirit under Churchill. Mm -hmm. Churchill did listen to different voices in making yeah. big decisions, but there was a real unity about wanting to win the war. Yeah, and... and by the standards of the time, had a reasonably diverse group around him, interestingly. Mainly well, men, of course, but, you know, politically diverse. I, I agree with that. By the way, this is a, that, that was a, uh, has been a big weakness historically in politics. Um, insufficient diversity in gender, which means that policies didn't take into account how women might react to them. Um, but also insufficient diversity in social class. I mean, this was a problem in the First World War, slightly less than the Second World War. Uh, I use examples in the book of the poll tax day, Barkler, and other yeah. blunders of government that were not really nasty. They were just completely misunderstood yes. the way that people without a great deal of cash would respond to a, to a poll tax. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and by the way, Bletchley Park, which was probably the most significant single team during the Second World War, more than 50% of the people there just happened to be women, and that Absolutely. made it important. Absolutely. One of the chapters I've enjoyed the most is uh, chapter three called Constructive Descent. And in that you talk about the infamous failed Everest mission in 1996 and also the United Airlines uh, desire crash in 1978, I think it was. And I think if I try and summarize the, uh, the point that you're trying to get across there is that as well as having a diversity of voices and views, those views need to be able to be heard. Um, mm. And I just think it's worth reflecting on, maybe you can sort of quickly retell the story around the captain of uh, United Airlines Flight 178, I think it was, because the, 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 the chief engineer knew that the, the flight was running out of fuel, but didn't feel it was his place to inform the captain. That's right. And the reason, of course, is the culture in the 1970s, it was a command and control model. The captain was the boss, the big cheese. Uh, the other members of the crew called him, and it was almost always a he, sir. Mm. And the problem there is if you tell somebody something they don't already know, and they're supposed to know everything, they can sometimes react in a rather defensive or punitive way. You know, the culture can really shut down the flow of information. 
And this is a particularly revealing case because the engineer needed to share the information in order to survive. And yet there's this unconscious shutting down of communication. Yeah. And this, by the way, it wasn't just United Airlines 173, Eastern Airlines 401. Uh, there was a DC-8 that flew into a mountain, uh, a number of problems with Asian airlines where there's a particularly steep hierarchy gradient mm. um, in the culture. Um, all can be traced back to this basic issue of good communication, which is yeah. why dissent um, is such an important quality in a group. Yeah, and it, it, it uh, I, I was thinking about it in the light of where we are now and, and moving we hope beyond the crisis, the immediate crisis that we're in, to the role of leaders and the characteristics of leaders. And, and you're, you're, you're quite equivocal about leadership. You know, you, you very much say that we must try and avoid these individual perspectives and look for holistic perspectives. I wonder if you sort of, if you look ahead, do you think that there is a case for leaders to, in future to be dialing down on their dominance characteristics a bit? I think leaders, the best leaders in the world we're in at the moment know how to pivot between leadership styles. So when they're talking to their group, to have the humility to listen in order to make a better choice. My own view, I know some disagree, is that we do need leadership in hierarchy. You need a decision taker. Otherwise, there's confusion over who's in charge, and it can lead to certain types of uh, dysfunctionality. Yeah. So I think organizations benefit from leadership. But when the leaders know how to listen, but once a decision has been taken, how to galvanize and to occasionally dominate, that's important too. Uh, I wouldn't wish to underestimate the significance of a leader who knows how to once a decision has been taken to say, right, we need to fall in line here. We need to start really pushing towards the target. Otherwise, we're going to be too slow. So I think leaders, I mean, this is actually quite an interesting branch of modern psychological research, the way that leaders, the really best leaders pivot, depending on where they are in the decision cycle. Yeah, situational leadership, I think some people call yeah. it. Is that yeah. what it's called? Yeah, yeah I think so, yeah. Yeah, I like that. I, I think that, I mean, are I actually... Are there organisations thought... where, you, where you see this kind of, these kind of positive habits taking place? Yeah, I think one of the, one of the things that got me thinking about it, I'll take it away from business, actually, but sport, hmm. is if you, I remember interviewing Nick Faldo, the golfer, yep. and asking about, what quality was important as a golfer? Do you need to be supremely confident? And he said, it's very naive to think that you need to stay right. I'm going to hit this ball. It's going to be fantastic. It's going to go in the hole. He said, when you're deciding on what shot to play, you need to be highly realistic. You need to say to yourself in the rough, yeah, I'm not going to get this out with a three wood straight onto the green. I need to be able to use a seven iron and knock it off. But he said once you, so you need to be humble. You need to consult your caddy. You need to really be highly rational at that point. But once you've decided to do something, then you need to be confident. You need to galvanize yourself in order to execute the shot. Or if you take a surgeon, a surgeon needs to be confident in his or her abilities to wield the scalpel at all. Mm. But if they're so confident that after the operation, they don't talk to their colleagues about how could I have done that differently and better, they never improve. Yes. Yeah. So Faldo, Faldo who, who famously, of course, won a championship with 18 pars, you know, the least, the least flamboyant way you could win a championship. Yeah, in fact, it was, I think, who was it? It was Azinger was in the mix, wasn't it? it was yeah, exactly, yes. I think. Uh, yeah, I remember Sorry. Uh, we, but, we, but actually, I mean, and, and I wouldn't want it to, you're, you're right about that, but it, it's not just Faldo, but Tiger Woods. This is, even the flamboyant players who win, yeah. they need to know when to rein in their flamboyance every now and again. I mean, Jack Nicholas said you need to know when to attack and defend on the putting surface. And I just think that surgeons, it's an amazing thing, the best surgeons are very confident when they're wielding the scalpel and very humble yes. when they're evaluating what they could have done better after the operation has finished. Yes. I know you're a busy man, and uh, I need to respect your time. Uh, before talking today, uh, because I wanted to bring in a diversity of views, I sent out some uh, social posts and said to people, right, I'm talking to Matthew today. What do you want to ask him? And I had an interesting question in which relates to the education sector, which I know is, you know, you're very much involved with. Um, and, and it was from a lady called Claire Muldoon. 
and she wanted to know about your thoughts on kick-starting learning and education after several months of lockdown and, and how we get children and parents and teachers together, uh, so different voices, different perspectives together in a productive way that we can galvanize our children in our learning sector again because there's no doubt it's a very subdued world in terms of you know children's education at the moment well yeah well thank you for that question i mean my my sense is i agree it's a subdued world it's been a tough period for for young people i've always felt that young people should have a voice within schools um, often teachers think they know what's going on but don't really know what's going on and when children have the opportunity to create their own um, shadow board if you like uh, they often are able to help teachers um, teach more effectively um, and I think you're probably right it wouldn't be a bad idea would it as schools go back to have parents students teachers create a forum figure out where the challenges were during lockdown where children think they're behind and to try and reimagine an academic year where I think they will have to make certain tweaks to make them effective. So I, I, I yeah, I think that's a very good idea. Great stuff. Well, thank you, Matthew. And um, uh, I don't know whether, you know, we, we should probably let you go now because I know, I know I'm mindful of your time. Um, I mean, closing, closing thoughts, I, I, you know, let's loop back round to, um, you know, the, very, the heart of the book. Um, there's one story in there which I think you tell about, uh, the, the, quote, the famous quote, really, from Justice Antonin Scalia um, of the Supreme Court. Um, just to kind of loop us back round to this idea of cognitive diversity, maybe you can just sort of retell his, what he said and why you think that is problematic. Well, Scalia, like lots of people in business, saw diversity as anti-meritocratic. He said you can either be diverse or you can be super duper. Uh, he had a way with his words, uh, Justice Scalia. And this is true, by the way. If you, if you think of an activity like sprinting and you're putting together a sprint relay team, the only dimension you're interested in is speed. If you have the four fastest runners in the world, assuming they can pass the bat on, you've got a winning team. And if somebody says, oh, but everyone in your team, they're all, you know, I don't know, white, male, middle class, you should diversify. And you said to them, yeah, but that would mean hiring slower runners. Mm. That's not a smart thing to do. But what Scalia missed and what Google, I think, missed 10 years ago is that if in a complex activity, everyone comes with the same insights. They're basically adding nothing to each other. If you're trying to come up with new ideas and you've got four people all coming up with the same ideas, they're not really adding to each other. With bricklaying, you, know, you have a few different bricklayers working on different walls and they're each laying bricks at 10 a minute, hypothetically. The productivity of the group is four times 10. It's additive. But that's not true of cognitive work, is it? Because if four people come up with the same ideas, they each come up with 10 ideas, but they're the same. You've only got 10 ideas overall. It's only when they come up with different ideas from one another that yeah. you start getting more. Moreover, when they come up with different ideas from one another, you get greater scope for the cross-pollination of ideas. You get this geometrical property, which increases the creativity of groups. This is why Google has stopped hiring from the same university all the time, because these software engineers were all learning under the same professor heuristics and by bringing people from different groups they saw this sudden change in the collective imagination this is where innovation happens brilliant brilliant well it's a great great story to end with um thank you again matthew saeed uh, author of rebel ideas the power of diverse thinking winner of cmi's management book of the year 2020 lovely to see you matthew thank you for your time and i hope we get the chance to talk to you again that's very kind, Matthew. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and uh, I'm really uh, gratified by the award. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Matthew. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>